Hello, my name is Madeline Reeves and I am Professor in the Anthropology of Migration in the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography at the University of Oxford. I'm also the director of the DPhil in Migration Studies and the aim of this webinar is to tell you a little bit about the DPhil in Migration Studies, in particular to tell you about the process of application, um, what we're looking for in a prospective um, research proposal, to tell you a bit about the process of identifying a prospective supervisor or supervisor for your project. I'll tell you a little bit about the structure of the programme um, and we'll also talk a little bit about applying for funding to fund your, um, your PhD or your DPhil. So, first of all, I want to say a little bit about applying for a PhD or a DPhil in general. And, and I want to say a little bit about that terminology. In Oxford, we tend to talk about a DPhil. Um, this is the same as a PhD that you will hear about in other programmes. So these thoughts, I think, really apply to um, the question of applying for a PhD programme anywhere, um, not just in Oxford. Um, but the first question to ask yourself is, Am I sure that this is what I want to do? Is this is is this what I need for my career? Um, not many careers outside academia require a PhD. Um, is this the right time to do a PhD in terms of other life priorities, the expectation of putting other things on hold, career plans and so forth? A really crucial question, I think, is about the intrinsic motivation. Um, there may be many reasons for wanting to do a PhD, um, but if you don't have the drive or the desire to just really get stuck into researching a question in great depth and potentially becoming um, one of the world experts in your little bit of, of, of knowledge or inquiry, um, it's really not worth doing a PhD. There are other ways, probably less stressful and demanding ways of reaching um, uh, career goals, certainly outside academia. So there has to be that intrinsic motivation for it to be worth it. And that's something that has to come across in your research proposal as well. I think it's important to ask yourself whether you really enjoy the nuts and bolts of doing academic research. Um, maybe you've had the experience of doing research for an undergraduate dissertation or a master's dissertation, and you've just found yourself excited by the thrill of finding something out, of going down rabbit warrens, of having the time to think deeply about certain questions. Um, but doctoral research will involve a lot of reading. It will involve a lot of writing. It will involve a lot of editing, of rewriting, of scrapping your writing. And it will probably involve a lot of solo working. This is not necessarily the case. There are some doctoral projects which are collaborative in the sense that you might be working closely with an external partner organisation. But even in such cases, your project um, is likely to be one that you are the person who is most invested in. Um, and so you have to really enjoy that process of, of solo working and potentially of solo field work, of going and doing field work, um, often in another country in a very different context for an extended period of time. Do you enjoy that? Are you excited by that prospect? I think it's important to ask yourself whether you're prepared to be a student still <laughs> or again. That is to say some people come to doing a PhD project to defill having had a, um, a break doing something quite different, getting um, uh, working in various organisations in public life and then decide to come back and do a PhD because there's something that they really, really want to research. Um, some people come to the DPhil straight after having done an undergraduate degree and a master's programme. So in either case, I think it's important to ask yourself the question, do I want to carry on being a student or do I want to return to being a student? With all of the things that come with that, with the excitement and the freedom that comes with that, but also the precarity that can come with that um, and the other kinds of demands um, with being with being an uh, with being a student for the next three or four years. I think it's important to ask whether you can put the time that is required into putting a good application together ahead of a January deadline. Most doctoral programmes, including that in Oxford, have um, deadlines that fall in early January. So 
is this the right time for you to be doing this project now? Might it be advisable to apply in a year's time um, to wait and for the next cycle? And in relation to that, I think it's worth thinking in particular, if you're planning to do research in a direction that is quite new for you, um, is now the right time in terms of should I take a year out potentially to gain relevant skills? That might be um, empirical skills that you require, methodological skills that you require, um, experience of living in the context that you plan to research, if this is um, a, an environment that you know so far only from um, books and other sources of information, are there language skills that you need to acquire? So thinking really in the round about this project in relation to you and your career stage and the skills that you have and whether it might benefit your application to um, get some uh, of uh, exposure, for instance, in the particular area that you're interested in, in researching or developing certain skills that might be useful for your project. I now want to say a little bit about the doctorate within the Oxford system. Um, for those of you who have um, been studying at the University of Oxford and perhaps within the UK, what I'm going to say is probably not necessarily um, uh, particularly new. But for those applicants who might be simultaneously applying to programmes uh, elsewhere in Europe, or for instance in North America, how the doctorate is organised might be quite different across those different systems. So things to know about the, the DPhil in Oxford is that you're going to be doing supervised independent research from day one, supervised in that you are going to be working closely with a supervisor, but independent research in that students on our programme really start working substantively on their project from the day that they get here. That's not to say that they don't quite significantly revise and refine their project. Um, but it's not a programme that includes a huge amount of coursework. If you are planning to do a doctorate that would involve two, sometimes three years of coursework before you reach the stage of developing a research proposal, you might be better advised to apply um, to other systems with longer doctoral training. In the UK, and in Oxford specifically, a PhD is typically intended to take three to four years of full-time study or six to eight years of part-time study. Sometimes students take longer than that, but that is what the programme is designed um, to do so that you're, you're intended to be getting stuck into your research really from, um, from the get-go. In the DPhil and migration studies, this will usually include, these three to four years of full-time study will usually include around 12 months of empirical fieldwork. And that can take a variety of different forms. That might be ethnographic fieldwork, it might be conducting a survey, um, it might be doing other kinds of data analysis. This usually takes place in the second year of the programme. And then on either side of that, you would be based in Oxford, undertaking a variety of um, courses, of fieldwork training, of methods training, of training in, in ethics. You'd be working quite closely with your supervisor, but also with a wider team um, of academics within the university who will be invested in your project in various ways. For instance, through um, work in progress seminars or through writing up seminars once you're back from, from doing your fieldwork. The Oxford system is also, again, distinctive in terms of some um, global comparisons in that you work very, very closely with a supervisor or sometimes with a supervisory team of two supervisors. Most students just have one um, supervisor with whom they work very, very closely from the get go in helping you to refine that project, to develop that project and to think very practically and concretely about how to translate some of those conceptual ideas that you've got, some of those burning research questions into feasible research uh, 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 undertakings in, in, in the field, right? There's often a kind of challenge of translating your big, exciting intellectual question into actions on the ground. How do I actually go about researching that? And then how do I go about translating that research that I've found, my findings, into, into a monograph-length text? 
Now, I say that um, because in some systems you might have, for instance, a committee, a larger committee. But there are also many opportunities in the Oxford system for other academics within the department to really get to know your work closely beyond your individual supervisor. So one of the other distinctive features of the Oxford training is that there are, before your final PhD submission, there are two moments of fairly formal assessment where your work will be read from two members of um, the department or the wider university, and you'll be given quite close feedback on that. So one of those moments we call the transfer of status, which typically comes um, at the end of three or four terms of study. So at the end of your first academic year and um, in the DPhil and migration studies, you would be assessed for that on your extended research proposal, a 20,000 word piece of work where you're really um, elaborating in quite a lot of detail both the conceptual underpinnings of your project and a discussion of the methods that you plan to use and its contribution. You then have a second point of assessment um, when you are sort of immersed in the process of writing up the dissertation, which is called a confirmation of status. And that kind of confirms you as eligible to be put forward for submission of the PhD. It doesn't necessarily mean that that submission is imminent, but it confirms in a sense, in a formal way that you are still working um, in a deep way on your project. And these moments give um, people within the department, others in the department, the chance to get to know your work very, very closely. There are also other opportunities to present to work in progress sessions and writing up seminars so that there will usually be beyond your supervisor, I would say a core of perhaps seven to eight academics across the department, including those who are assessing your work, who really get to know your project very well too, beyond your supervisor. And you're very welcome to talk to, to them and to any other members of the department that you feel are relevant to your project. So it's wider opportunities, multiple opportunities for wider feedback within the program. Within the program. Um, this acronym WIPS, WIPS, stands for Work in Progress Seminars. And those are something that are distinctive for the DPhil in migration studies. They are run by the Centre on Migration Policy and Society, and they involve all of the Compass community, all of the scholars associated with Compass, um, attending these and again, giving you, giving you um, uh, feedback on your presentations. There are teaching opportunities within the Oxford system. Some of our students work as um, tutors, some um, might be running seminars for the MSc in Migration Studies. But I should mention that, again, in contrast with some other um, uh, university systems where DPhil students or PhD students are kind of treated as an integral part of the teaching team and indeed in many places are intensely relied upon to provide undergraduate teaching, that isn't the case in the Oxford system. So there are teaching opportunities, but it's important not to assume that that is a way that you can necessarily fund um, your doctoral training. I'll say more about funding in a little moment. But that gives you a bit of a sense about the wider sort of Oxford system, how the DPhil training um, is organised. Um, in terms of the application process now, I think the key things to think about in, in putting your application together are in making very visible the background preparation and training that makes you a really good person to be undertaking this proposed project. So there are certain formal criteria here and you can find those on um, the, the, the admissions website. At a formal level, you need to have um, a minimum of a 67% in um, as an average in your master's training, including a distinction in the dissertation component. And you need to have a high 2-1 or a first in your undergraduate training. That's if you're coming from um, a UK uh, undergraduate and master's training. There are equivalencies for those students coming from the US who have a GPA requirement and there are equivalencies for other national systems. You can find all of those on the website. What matters, I think, as a baseline is that most of the students coming to us, certainly most of the students who are um, successful in obtaining competitive funding, will have 
a first class undergraduate degree and a distinction in a master's degree. There can be exceptions to that. There are different kinds of backgrounds that students come with. Um, some students might undertake a DPhil having had um, an extended period working um, in, a, in a relevant career and might bring um, some of the, the relevant training and might present in their application the ways in which that training, for instance, um, has equivalency to, for instance, a master's degree. But um, as a general rule, what we are looking for are scholars who are prepared in terms of their intellectual background, but also in terms of their prior training to be able to undertake independent research and to be able to undertake independent research on quite a big scale, right, on a project that will last you three or four years and to be able to produce a piece of work that is monograph length. We're in particular looking to see, is this an intellectually exciting and engaging scholarly proposal? So the proposal is really a key component in your in your application and it needs to do the work not simply of telling us, here's an interesting question that I think I'd like to ask, or here's something that I'm interested in and, and, and I'd like to spend the next three years of my life researching this. But it needs to do the work of telling your prospective supervisor, telling a committee, um, telling people in the wider discipline, why should they care about this? Why is it important that you do this research now? Why does it matter? That's what I'm calling here the so what question. So you've got to kind of show the intellectual excitement of the project. In assessing whether we offer you a place, we're also looking to see, are we, as a department, as a program, are we able to offer the doctoral supervision that this would require? Do we have the personal people available who have, for instance, the um, expertise in the particular thematic, conceptual areas that you are exploring? And do those people have availability to take on new supervisees? Do we have expertise in the relevant um, regional area? Um, do we have um, colleagues who have the particular methodological expertise? For instance, if you're planning to, I don't know, work with um, big data sets or with um, particular bodies of, of, of literature which would require particular kinds of specialist supervision. So are we able to offer the supervision? And um, why you to do this project, right? Why now? Why here? Why you? Sometimes students apply to Oxford um, because it's a university with a good reputation, um, because it has a name, without necessarily thinking about the question of is this the right fit for my project? Is this department the right fit for my project? Is this program the right fit for, for this project? Is there the supervision expertise in this university that, that, that would be right for my project? And the answer to that question might be yes, it might be no. But I think it's very important for um, doctoral level research to be applying first and foremost because of the kind of supervisory expertise that you are going to receive in that place, to really have a sense of, yes, there's this person whose work I've read, whose work I've engaged with, whose work I find exciting that I would really like to work with. And if that is in Oxford, that is wonderful. Um, it might be elsewhere. And of course, you are very welcome to apply to multiple um, doctoral programmes. And indeed, given the paucity of funding and the number of applications, I, I would suggest that that is a very sensible thing to do. But always keeping in mind, are these places to which I'm applying places where there, there would be a really good fit for my project? Um, so why the DPhil in migration studies? Well, this is the slide that we might call, in a sense, the pitch, what's distinctive about the DPhil in migration studies in Oxford. I think the first thing to say is that migration as a field of inquiry is incredibly vibrant um, in the University of Oxford. There is just an incredible breadth and depth of expertise um, across multiple domains of migration and across multiple ways of approaching migration, across quantitative and qualitative methodologies, across different regional areas. I'm not going to try to summarise all of those now because they are so extensive. 
But there are several ways in which you can you can sort of read up around that. Um, the two things to mention, I would say, that are important are that we have two dedicated research centres that focus on different aspects of migration, amongst which there is a lot of collaboration and some degree of overlap. So the first is COMPASS, the Centre on Migration Policy and Society, which is housed within the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography, and where there is an awful lot of both very theoretical and very policy facing um, research on a whole variety of aspects of migration within the UK and internationally. There is also the Refugee Studies Centre, which is housed within um, ODID, um, which is our School of Development, uh, International Development. Um, the Refugee Studies Centre has as the name suggests, a particular interest in refugee and forced migration experience um, and brings together a variety of expertise across multiple different disciplines, including political science, um, anthropology, sociology, geography, but also law, for instance. There are uh, um, uh, legal scholars working on um, international law, on refugee law. Um, so there are these two kinds of centres and each of these has its own events, it has its own seminar series, it has its own traffic of visitors and you could quite literally attend a seminar um, hosted by these centres probably sort of every day of your training if you so desire. There is just a huge amount of stuff um, going on and these also offer opportunities for kind of much more informal collaboration um, to meet other DPhil students with similar areas of interest, um, potentially to supervise on our dedicated mi Migration Studies Master's program, which attracts some brilliant students, um, around 30 to 40 brilliant students every year undertaking that dedicated master's program. There is also a sort of looser network called Migration Oxford, which acts as a kind of umbrella for um, people across the university with research interests in migration who might be associated with Compass or the Refugee Study Centre, but they might equally be in history, in music, in literature, in medicine, and so on and so forth, in geography. There is a huge um, breadth of expertise. And Migration Oxford offers um, a sort of platform for the organisation of events. So it has that kind of network function. It can also offer sponsorship for events that you as a student might want to organise. And again, it, it provides a kind of context for information sharing, um, for instance, about visiting speakers who might be giving relevant seminars in other parts of the university. So it acts as a, as a sort of um, information sharing and umbrella organisation for identifying expertise and for bringing people together. I've mentioned already that across these different um, environments, particularly in Compass and the Refugee Studies Centre, there are various opportunities for interfacing with policy and, and practice. So, for instance, within Compass, um, there is the Global Exchange on Migration, GEM, which works in a very intentional way um, and, and quite a policy focusing way, for instance, on questions of migrant integration in the UK. Um, and they work in close collaboration with the third sector, with um, um, local councils, with national policy programming. Um, and then there is the Migration Observatory, which acts as a, as a forum for deep policy of facing analysis of issues relating to migration in the UK. And, you know, very often you'll see um, members of um, the Migration Observatory being interviewed on, you know, the Today programme on Radio 4 being interviewed about um, contemporary migration issues facing the UK. So I think in terms of why Oxford, um, there is this depth of expertise, there is this um, uh, integration into two and, and an opportunity for supervision across two different schools, across the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography and the School of International Development. And you would be integrated then into a scholarly network that is both broad and deep. So that's what's, I think, distinctive about migration studies in, in, in Oxford. 
Um, I've mentioned already or alluded already to this departmental structure. So the DFIL in migration studies is administered through the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography. But as I've mentioned, it has close links with um, the Department for International Development. And indeed, um, many students are supervised by somebody from ODID sometimes from somebody from ODID and somebody from SAME. Um, so it works, it sits across these two, uh, these two schools, but it is administered through the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography. Um, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of information that is on the web pages, particularly when it comes to the profile of prospective supervisors. So I've mentioned already the importance of that supervisor supervisee fit. And many of the inquiries that I receive as DFIL director are about prospective um, supervisors. So I would encourage you to look at these two pages. Um, QEH here, that acronym is just the, the acronym for Queen Elizabeth House, which is one of the ways that people sometimes refer to the Department for International Development. So it's 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 the, the second of those um, uh, links there at the bottom is two prospective supervisors in international development. One thing to keep in mind in terms of identifying a prospective um, supervisor is that not all of the staff who are involved in teaching at the University of Oxford are able to offer doctoral supervision. That might be because of the nature of their contract, because they have a short term contract and we want to make sure that a supervisor will be um, available to provide supervision for the length of your PhD. Or it might simply be because, for instance, that academic member of staff might be having a significant role within their college or a significant administrative role that means that for a certain period of time they are not admitting new doctoral students. So have a look at people's profiles. It will generally indicate the areas in which they are um, able to offer doctoral supervision. And it will also indicate if they are unavailable to supervise. But I would always advise you to, to, to check with a prospective supervisor first um, to check that they would be able to offer supervision in your area. So, um, is the DFIL and migration studies the best place for your project? Well, that will be very much depend on the nature of the project. If migration is central to the project and migration here understood in the broadest sense, we're very, very inclusive when we come to thinking about um, uh, issues relating to migration and mobility and borders uh, in the in the very broadest sense. It's an it's an interdisciplinary degree, and that's something in which we take great pride. Most of the people um, who are applying to the DPhil in migration studies could potentially house their project in a particular academic discipline. They might have a background training in anthropology, in international relations, um, in law, in geography and so forth. And indeed, some of our applicants also apply to a disciplinary programme. I think the DFIL and migration studies would be a great home for your project if by the nature of your project and by the nature of your own uh, intellectual interests and potentially also career ambitions, you are interested in and keen to be working across different disciplines or at least in an interdisciplinary environment where you can draw on the insights that people coming from outside your home discipline might bring. So, for instance, I think of myself first and foremost as a social anthropologist. That is the, the domain in which I received my own doctoral training. But I had quite an uh, interdisciplinary training prior to undertaking my doctorate. My undergraduate degree was in social and political sciences, where I would say I was predominantly um, studying the history of political thought and um, political theory. My master's degree um, was primarily in um, Soviet social history. I have a background in, in, in the study of um, Soviet Central Asia, and it was kind of through that that I developed my interest in contemporary Central Asia and in anthropology. But um, if you are the kind of student who has an interdisciplinary background or just who has um, a kind of interest in, in drawing on multiple disciplines, then this might be a good home for you. That's not to say that each project is necessarily interdisciplinary. 
Um, amongst our students, there are students who are who 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 think of themselves very much as uh, sociologists or as anthropologists or as political scientists, who but who but who want to be in a in a sense in an intellectual environment where they are able to draw upon the expertise of scholars working on migration, but from related disciplines. And certainly, I think for the study of something like migration. Um, there are huge advantages to being conversant with and being in conversation with scholars from outside of a single disciplinary area. So, for instance, um, for those who might be deploying ethnographic methods to nonetheless be able to engage in conversation with scholars who might be applying more quantitative methods um, and vice versa. So I think that's that's very much linked to your goals beyond the DPhil. Um, but as I say, I think it's also tied to your own um, your own training and your own sense of how and where you would like your project to best be located. So now we get on to the nitty gritty of applying. And the first thing I will say is that I would refer you primarily to our website. That's where the up to date information is. That's where the detailed information is. This is in the round. We're looking for um, uh, this set of information from you. And I would say that um, for the committees who are making these assessments, all of these things are important. Your transcripts are important for us to see precisely the training that you've had. Have you got the methodological training you require? Have you got the kind of disciplinary background that 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 will help you to kind of formulate the conceptual questions for your project? But we are also looking at your letters of reference. We're looking at your writing samples and we're looking at your research proposal. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit in more detail about the research proposal itself. I think the best way to approach it is to think of this as a pitch for a project, a competitive pitch for a project, right? Because this is where um, as a as a department and as a program, we will be reviewing dozens of applications and we cannot offer places um, even to, you know, half of the brilliant projects that 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 are submitted to the program. So think of it as a pitch and it's a pitch that has to work towards different audiences. First and foremost, your proposal has to convince your prospective supervisor that this is a project that they will be intellectually invested in supervising for the next three, four years, and indeed potentially beyond, because very often DFIL projects lead to postdoc projects, lead to subsequent research collaborations. So you have to convince your supervisor that this would be a good fit with their intellectual interests. Um, and the way to do that is not by somehow sort of writing grandiose words about how wonderful the work of your supervisor is. That's not the way to do it, but by by showing how exciting your intellectual project is and why it's it's now is a good time to be researching this 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 field. So it's got to speak to your prospective supervisor. It also has to speak to the wider admissions panel who will be in your broader field discipline. So in our case, that will be, they will have an interest in migration studies. They will have expertise in migration studies. They might, in that case, be outside of your immediate academic discipline. Um, so you have to be able to speak to a wider readership who will be reading your proposal and making an adjudication on it. Um, and so that matters that if, for instance, you are wanting to do a project um, let's say that is deeply ethnographic, it's important that you communicate the importance of that project and the relevance of those chosen methodologies to people in migration studies who might not be anthropologists or who might not be deploying ethnographic methods in their own research. And then the third constituency who you have to convince of the importance of your project are other social scientists who sit on funding allocation panels. Now, this is significant because in particular, if you are applying for funding through the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, decisions about funding there are not made by your supervisor. They are made by a committee more broadly of social scientists um, who are making adjudications across a whole variety of different applications across the social scientists as uh, sciences to say, should this project receive funding or should this project receive funding? 
And so the task there, I think, and the challenge, because it is a challenge, is to be able to write that project in such a way that while you are showing your capacity to speak to cutting edge scholarly debates in your kind of little narrow area, it also needs to do the work um, of convincing a wider readership of why is this project exciting? Why should I care about this? Again, it comes back to that so what question. Um, and that is the skill then of, of communicating the excitement of your project in ways that might link to broader debates in the social sciences or that shows your own capacity to link that, that little thing that you're wanting to research to wider questions, wider questions in our contemporary world, for instance, wider questions that might interest other social sciences. So I think it's worth keeping in mind those different audiences who will all be reading your proposal and they might be reading it for different purposes, right? Do I want to supervise this project? Can we admit this person onto our doctoral programme? And does this person deserve our, you know, some of our limited pot of funding? So foreground the intellectual excitement. Why this project now? Why you? What is it about your skill set or your life experience indeed? Um, your knowledge of um, the particular context that you're wanting to research, your knowledge of languages, your experience working in a relevant um, uh, area. What is it that you bring that makes you the right person to be doing this project now? Okay, so I think this is fairly self-evident, but these questions, I would say, are the key things that the proposal itself needs to include. Um, so, what are the questions that are driving your research? It's really important to have research questions there that are clearly articulated so that it's clear not just that you're generally interested in a particular thematic area of inquiry, but that there are questions that you feel you want to pose and that you have a sense to, about how you would potentially go about answering them. So your methodology. So why this project matters now, how this project will make an original contribution to knowledge, how you plan to undertake that research. So a little bit about methodology that doesn't need to be excessively detailed, but it does need to show us that you've thought about questions of feasibility. You know, if you're wanting to understand, let's say, um, if you're wanting to conduct research in Xinjiang, right, in Western China, have you thought about questions of access? Have you thought about questions of feasibility? Have you thought about the security concerns or um, the ways that a particular geopolitical environment might impact upon your research. You need to tell us with whom you hope to work and why you think that this potential supervisor or these potential supervisors um, would be the people that you would most like to work with. You'll be asked on your application form to indicate whether you have a particular supervisor in mind. Um, and you can also mention that in your proposal. That doesn't guarantee that you would have that supervisor, but it does mean that we'll be kind of aware of that in the application process. And a little bit about the added benefits to you of being in Oxford. In those 2000 words, I wouldn't say, you know, that that needs to be extensive or elaborate, but it does need to tell us that you have got a good sense of why it is you want to be in Oxford particularly, and not just because of the university's own name or reputation. What is it about this particular um, concentration of expertise or these particular areas of emergent research that are being undertaken here that make you think that you would be a good fit and that this would be a good fit for you? So I've mentioned the importance of, of identifying a prospective supervisor. And I think for those people who are um, not you know, particularly who are applying outside the UK context, this can be an area that is tricky. How do I identify a supervisor? My advice there would be to start with the work that you have found to be inspirational to you, the work that you've been excited by during your undergraduate studies, during your master's studies. What is it about their work that excites you? And I would say be guided in terms of your doctoral applications primarily by who are the people that I would most like to work with. Um, and when you're thinking about a supervisor, think about the supervisor, not just in terms of their um, intellectual profile, but is this somebody that I could see myself working with over the next few years? 
do I like the way that they write? Do I like the way that they present an academic argument? Do I like the way that they um, write themselves into a text or not? Do I find the particular kinds of questions that they are posing inspiring? Sometimes you can get a good sense of that, not just by reading their academic work, but by um, listening to podcasts that they've given or reading blogs that they've written, getting a sense of how they might um, communicate in a more free form way, how they might work with you as a supervisor. Look, at, of course, at their, at their web pages and get a sense of, you know, their current research interests. And it might be that somebody who has a research interest that is at one level most closely aligned with yours in that perhaps they've done research in the same country or they've been looking at the same um, kind of conceptual question. It might be that that person is the most relevant for your project. It's, it, it's very likely that that is the case. But it might be that you want to find a supervisor who, for instance, doesn't necessarily work in your proposed geographical area of research, but who has worked on analogous questions in a different area, or who is somebody who is pioneering, let's say, particular methodologies, or who is an expert, let's say, in digital ethnography, and you feel that that is a kind of skill set that's really important for you from your prospective supervisor. So think about which kind of expertise is most relevant for your project and contact them. Um, prospective supervisors are always happy to hear from um, prospective DFIL candidates. Um, they're always excited to hear that, you know, that somebody who's got interests in the same kind of area. Um, my advice there would be to keep in mind that your prospective supervisor might be getting lots of such um, communications, lots, lots of such initial inquiries. So don't send them on that first email, you know, your entire master's thesis and say, you know, please have a look at this. Would you like to read this? Um, I think you might be interested in it. Keep that initial contact focused and polite. Find out whether they are indeed taking on doctoral students in the current in the coming cycle and tell them a little bit about the proposed project and whether, you know, whether they might be interested in in a follow up. Um, but keep in mind that they will probably be getting many such queries. So um, keep it short. Keep it you know, relatively open and 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 then that can allow for some future follow up. Um, you don't have to have identified a supervisor at the point that you apply. It's not compulsory. And as a committee, again, if there are excellent projects where a student hasn't already identified a supervisor, we will try to do that ourselves. We'll think about who might be a good fit for that project. But if a prospective supervisor has already been in touch with you and has a sense of what your project might be, that may be advantageous. So having that early communication helps. Another top tip. One of the things that we ask for as part of the application process is um, two uh, writing samples. And sometimes students worry that, you know, they're wanting to send a writing sample that might be, let's say, for an essay they wrote as part of their undergraduate degree, which was on something completely unrelated to what it is they plan to research. That's not a problem. Um, what we're wanting to get off is a sense of how you write, how you reason, how you draw on data, how you put together an argument. It doesn't need to be thematically related to what it is that you're planning to, um, to research. If you're planning to give an extract from, let's say, a master's thesis as one of your writing samples, have a think about which part will best show off your skills of analysis. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the introduction to the thesis. We'll completely understand that you've given us a part of a thesis that is from the, you know, from the middle of it. Um, and, you know, you can always preface your submission by, 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 by telling us about where in the thesis it comes. Um, but do foreground work that will allow us to see how do you lay out an argument, how do you reason, how do you, you know, work with data and so forth. My third top tip in relation to the application process, we ask for three references. Um, if you're not able to supply all three at the point of application, um, we will review your application if it only has two references and then we would ask for a third one later on. Um, it's important that your referees are people who can really speak about you as a student, your style of learning 
and who can speak to the quality of your academic work. So we prefer that these referees are academic if possible, but we well recognise that, you know, you may have been um, you may have finished your undergraduate or graduate degree, master's degree a while ago. You may have been working and it may be um, that, that one of your referees would be from an employment context. Um, if that is the case, I think it's useful potentially to share a draft of your proposed project so that they at least have a sense of kind of the intellectual questions that you're wanting to to. Um, to address. But the bottom line here is that it's much better to have referees who really know you and really know your work than potentially somebody you think of as, quote, a big name um, who might be less familiar with your work. We're not, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're really wanting to get a sense of you from those letters. And another kind of piece of advice here, again, it's something that often comes up um, with queries, with questions about at what point should I apply? Is now the right time for me to apply? And this particularly is the case if you are applying at the point that you are just embarking on a master's degree. When I say just embarking, you might be at this point in the year. Um, and I'm recording this in late November. It might be that you are just two or three months into a master's programme. And you might be thinking about doctoral level study. That's wonderful about your future plans. There is nothing, absolutely nothing to stop you from applying when you are partway through a master's degree. Something to keep in mind, though, is that when we are making judgments about your capacity to undertake a doctoral level length piece of work, um, one of the best indications that we have of that is your independent work to date, that is to say any thesis that you have written as part of your undergraduate degree or as part of your master's degree. And it's quite hard for us to make that assessment, for instance, if you don't yet have any grades from your master's programme, because the master's is kind of, you know, only sort of partway through the course. And in particular, if you don't have marks to show for your master's dissertation. So if you're deliberating about it, my encouragement would be to say, perhaps consider applying once you already have your master's degree, in a sense, in hand. Um, when you have that transcript, when you can hopefully say, you know, that you received a, dis a distinction on your master's thesis, that is a very, very useful indicator to us of your capacity to undertake doctoral research. That doesn't stop you from applying when you are partway through um, a master's degree. Um, but um, it does mean that your your committee may not have as much information to go on in making an assessment about competitiveness for funding and so forth. OK, one thing that I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of are some of the projects that our current students are working on. Now, these are just a selection. Um, We've currently got around um, 25 students at different stages of the program, um, beginning from first year to those who are completing their, their PhD. Um, and I include these as sort of placeholder titles. These aren't the titles of the particular projects, but they're just giving you a sense of the kind of thematic areas to give you a bit of a sense of the diversity of kinds of questions that students are working on the kinds of places in which um, students are conducting research um, and a little bit, I guess, you know, some of these perhaps might give a little bit of a sense of the kind of disciplinary identity of the students, um, but the range, right? Um, I don't want you to see these as in any way uh, prescriptive or indicative of the kind of projects that we're likely to accept in the future. It's just to give you a bit of a sense of the kinds of range really of projects that, that are supervised. It's worth mentioning that the significant majority of our students um, are from outside the UK. It's a very, very international program, unsurprisingly, and um, a significant proportion of our students have also had some lived experience of um, of migration in the broadest sense, that might be experiences of refugeehood, of forced displacement. Um, it might be um, experiences of living as an undocumented migrant in the US. You know, that's not a that's by no means a prerequisite or a requirement. But it is to say that um, 
if you feel that your own background is one that might not be quotes typically Oxford, um, that is you you would be extremely. I think you'd feel very at home in our in our program. Okay. We're running towards the end now of this webinar. Um, I do want to say a little bit about funding for your um, PH, PhD or for your DPhil. Um, on this slide, um, you can see some of the sources of uh, the sources of information about funding. There are dedicated pages to this, both within the School of Anthropology and university level pages. And I would encourage you to have a good look at those. There are two key sources of sort of in what we call internal funding. That's to say sort of funding that comes through and that is administered through um, the University of Oxford. One of these are called Clarendon scholarships or Clarendon studentships. There isn't a separate application process to this. Um, we can put forward um, uh, those, those candidates to whom we've offered places automatically for consideration for Clarendon scholarships. But these are highly competitive. There are only 200 annually, and this is across all of the subjects across the university, all of the departments. So, you know, um, the School of Anthropology usually gets, um, you know, a small number of these, but you shouldn't rely on this. It's extremely competitive. Then there is funding through the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, which is administered through what we call the Grand Union Partnership, which is a partnership between Oxford, Brunel and the Open University. And this partnership has a series of pathways through which funding is allocated, including the Migration Studies pathway. So um, I would strongly encourage you if you feel that your project would fit the remit of that Migration Studies pathway, and if you're applying to the DPhil in Migration Studies, it probably does, um, I would encourage you to uh, apply for that too. It requires ticking a box on your application form for the university and then it requires a separate application um, to the ESRC or to the, the doctoral training program um, and they have their own internal competition but we put forward those students um, who we feel are most competitive um, for that for that funding scheme. Then there are a variety of sources of external funding. Now, what I've included here is a sample of some of the recent sources of funding that students um, have received. This is by no means exhaustive. Um, and it's to kind of reassure you, I guess, that there are external sources of funding. Some of these are tied to um, particular place of residency or where you received your undergraduate degree. Some are linked to particular substantive or thematic areas of inquiry. So for instance, Wellcome Trust um, funds research broadly in the area of medicine and health, but very, very broadly understood. And they also fund social science projects. If you feel that your project could potentially fit that remit, it might be very much worth um, looking at that. There are sources of funding that might be linked to the particular geographical area in which you are planning to conduct research. Um, as an example here, I've given one that I'm familiar with because of the area of the world in which I work, which is called the Nizami Ganjavi Centre in Oxford. Um, and this supports research in the Caucasus and Central Asia. So the broader point here is that um, there is funding available, but it is not the case, and I'm sure all of us in Oxford would, would love it to have been the case that we could offer automatic funding to all of the students to whom we offer a place on the programme. In Oxford, as in other UK universities, that is not the case. Um, and that is particularly important for those of you who might be applying from um, the US, because in the US and in North America generally, it's much more common for programs, at least in Ivy League universities, to offer funding um, to a significant proportion of their graduate students or to, for instance, offer teaching assistantships where your fees are essentially paid for through the teaching that you conduct for the department. That isn't the case in Oxford. It isn't the case in most of the UK um, higher education system. So the bottom line here is that we are, and I say we as a department, um, are here to support you in the process of applying for funding. We want you to be able to secure funding to, to, to you know, take up a place 
um, that has been offered to you as much as you do. Um, but it is important to be proactive about that, to do that background research, to think about what it is in your own, in the proposed project that you're planning to undertake or the, the area that you come from. Um, are there sources of funding, for instance, that you could apply for from your home country? Are there aspects of your um, personal heritage that might make you uh, relevant for particular funding schemes? So there can be funding schemes that are specific to particular categories of student, for instance, including, for instance, those with experience of, of um, forced migration. Um, but it is worth really doing your funding here and it is quite time consuming. It's an important part of getting your ducks lined up um, for the for the for the application deadline and for, you know, hopefully being able to take up the place of an offer. And although it can be time consuming, it is also a useful skill. It's, you know, applying for funding is something that um, academics in the UK spend an awful lot of their time <laughs> doing um, of necessity. And so, you know, actually getting a sense of that funding landscape, while it can be time consuming, um, can be very useful in the long run when you, for instance, come to apply, for instance, to look for postdoc funding, you know, if you're already aware of these funders and what their remits are. Um, I'm getting to the very end here now. Once you've applied, so this gives you a little bit of a sense of the kind of the rundown of the process. There'll be preliminary che checks um, undertaken by our administrative team for completeness, checking that, you know, the references are there, that your transcripts are there, that you've got your um, results of any um, English language or other tests that are required, um, that the translations that are, might be required are in are in hand. Once you've got um, those uh, documents in order, then the applications are then reviewed by an academic committee. This will include an assessment from your prospective supervisor, um, but the applications will be reviewed in a sense by an independent committee. This is significant because it means that if you've been in touch with a supervisor and that supervisor has said, you know, Yes, I would be, you know, in principle, happy to supervise your project or I'm excited by your project. That in itself is not necessarily guarantee of being offered a place. Um, so it's important for, for, to keep that in mind, that 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 review and ranking process takes place by committee and your proposal will be and, and your your submitted documents will be assessed in relation to all of the others that have been um, submitted by the deadline. We then identify supervisors for highly ranked candidates. Now, that might be the supervisor that you have nominated. It might be that if you have nominated a supervisor and so have three other highly ranked candidates and that supervisor can only take on one new student, it might be that we identify another prospective supervisor for you. Um, and then there's a process of putting departmental shortlists forward for those sources of internal funding that I mentioned, the Clarendon funding and the ESRC funding. And again, these are assessed by their own um, panels. This isn't something that is done at a departmental level. So unsurprisingly, all of this takes some time and it can mean that once you've submitted your application, you might be thinking, well, why is it taking so long for somebody to tell me whether I've got an offer of a place or not? Um, it takes a long time because lots of people will be reading your application and, and hopefully giving it a lot of care and a lot of tension and a lot of thought and thought about, you know, fit and, and super, supervisory expertise and so forth. It's also because notification of funding can take a while to come through because these funding competitions um, can only make their determinations once they have heard from departments the, the people for whom the department is offering a place. So as a ballpark kind of figure, you can expect to hear about the offer of a place within about 10 weeks. You may not hear about the outcomes of funding until the summer. Um, so that is to say there is this kind of waiting period. Um, things are happening behind the scenes. So don't assume that not having heard anything is necessarily bad news. It certainly isn't. It just means that there are lots of processes underway and people reviewing your application. What we would ask from our side is that you keep us in the loop about um, the other places to which you have applied and the other places 
from which you have received offers and and certainly offers of funding. Um, sometimes students can feel a little bit embarrassed about saying, oh, yes, you know, by the way, I've also applied to this, that and the other university. Um, that is absolutely fine. Indeed, we 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 assume that that is the case. We, we are extremely mindful of the fact that um, students uh, you know that there's limited funding and that students will be um, wanting to reach out to to different prospective supervisors. Um, that said, I wouldn't encourage you to apply to lots and lots of different universities. I think keeping really focused on where would be the best fit for my project. But it might be that you've applied to two or three different universities in the UK and possibly um, outside the UK as well. So what we would ask simply is that you keep us in the loop about your decision making process. Um, this is important because if we know, for instance, that you have taken up the offer of funding from a different university, um, that we can then potentially, you know, keep that in mind in our own determinations. And that, you know, um, it's very often the case indeed that that I remain in contact with students who have ended up studying at different universities. Um, the fact that you have chosen to take up a place in a different uh, university, um, it might make us sad that we you know, that we're not going to enjoy your wonderful uh, um, creative input amongst our midst. But we will be extremely happy for you that you have received an offer from a different university and that you're going to be taking up a place there. It in no way is something to be sort of uh, uh, coy about. Um, we, we we would much rather know. We would much rather know. Um, and certainly, a prospective supervisor who may have been sort of working with you on a proposal. And, you know, um, it, it, they would they would also much rather know if you're if you're not going to be coming so that they you know, that they can keep in mind who which other candidates might be um, um, coming to work with them instead. And, and and, you know, each supervisor probably has a finite number of students that they can admit in any one year. So those conversations are important. So that's it from me. Um, I do hope that this has answered some of the questions that you might have, and I hope it's given you a little bit of an insight into the program. There's lots of information online. I would encourage you to follow up the links that are in these slides. Um, if you have questions on the admissions process, then please direct them to admissions at anthro.ox.ac.uk. If you have let's say, more substantive questions about questions of fit or particular supervisor or, or, or um, um, please direct them to me. Um, you've got my email there, madeline.reeves at compass.ox.ac.uk. Um, and I can immediately see that I've got a typo in compass, so that's not good. I want it's a single S, not a double S there. I'm not sure that I can even edit into this. No, I can't. So um, apologies for that. Um, but um, yeah, I would welcome any queries and please send them my way. And thank you and good luck with your applications.